الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم في الشرف الأشم والنور الأتم الكمال المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيدي ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم التي نبارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم العجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أصله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ تأذن ربكم لئن شكرتم لأزيدنكم ولئن كفرتم إن عذابي لشديد وقال موسى إن تكفروا أنتم ومن في الأرض جميعا فإن الله لغني حميد ألم يأتكم نبأ الذين من قبلكم قوم نوح وعاد وثمود والذين من بعدهم لا يعلمهم إلا الله جاءتهم رسلهم بالبينات فردوا أيديهم في أفواههم وقالوا إنا كفرنا بما أرسلتم به وإنا لفي شك مما تدعوننا إليه مريب رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين So in today's khutbah inshallah obviously everybody has the coronavirus on their minds and the kind of panic that many cities are experiencing people are running into grocery stores and fighting each other over toilet paper and toothbrushes and all kinds of things, you know, hand, cider, hand sanitizer has become a rare commodity now. I'm sure those stocks are going up. Um, and in the, in the light midst of all of that panic, of course, um, congregations of large number, uh, it's advised uh, in any city that's been affected by it that congregations of large number not be held. And everybody already knows that, you know, things like sporting events or religious ceremonies and things like that, um, that it's being advised for the, for the larger, you know, community's health, that they not be held. And, that's actually something I personally find very convincing and agree with also. Uh, my own take on a, a community decision here at Bayina Masjid at our, at our campus to not hold the Jumu'ah for the entire community. Uh, there's only like maybe seven or eight people here today uh, in the Jumu'ah on my instruction. Um, and the reason to do that is, uh, you know, on my process in coming up with this decision, I wanted to, you know, you guys to know how I arrive at such a decision. Um, my first inclination is to discuss this with people who know better than I do. And in this matter, I do like to consult uh, Dr. Akram Nadawi. And so I did give him a call and discuss this with him and, and shared with him what we have going on in our city and so many other cities. And it is not just his, but many other scholars' opinion that if there's a larger harm to come out of the community, then we don't have to think that it's more righteous uh, to come to the, the Jum'ah. And so I, before I talk about the subject of the khutbah today, I wanted to address what some people might think is the more Islamic approach. So somebody might come out and say, no, 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 you have to fear only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you should not be afraid and this is a conspiracy of the kuffar and you know, and this is all kinds of opinions are thrown out because the, the internet's a crazy place. Uh, and not only the internet, the masjid can be a crazy place. Everybody has their own opinion on what to do and uh, not have any fear or concern because if Allah is protecting us, nothing is going to happen to us. While all of that is true, when Allah protects us, nothing can happen to us, and Allah gave us these guarantees in the Quran, إِن اللَّهُ فَلَا غَالِبَ لَكُمْ If Allah were to aid you, then there's no one that can overpower you. There's absolutely no one or no thing that can ever overpower you. However, on the flip side, Allah does teach us a thing or two about caution. 
Uh, and he does teach us that the, we live in a world in which we have to use common sense. It's not like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he was making hijrah from Mecca to Medina said, Allah will protect me. I'm gonna walk right out the front door and go right out, walk right outside of Medina. There had to be a plan and a strategy and an escape you know, route and secret passages, you know, secret pathways and secret timings in order to escape the enemy's plan. And at the end of the day, we, the, what we learn in our religion is we do the best we can, we take whatever precaution we can, and then protection only comes from Allah. You don't get to drive into a red light speeding and then say Allah will protect me. No, you, you have to take your precautions and yes, Allah will protect you. And if Allah decides some harm will come your way, it doesn't matter how many traffic signs you observe, if it was gonna come your way, it was gonna come your way, there's no way to avoid that. But our religion does teach that kind of responsibility. The other thing is if somebody says, I don't care, I'm coming, or we have to stick together, it's not just about you. It's not just about a concern for you. You could, by sitting, you may have, for example, this virus, and you're sitting next to someone whose immune system is very weak, and you, don't, you didn't get affected by it, maybe you didn't even know you had it, and a few days later it emerged that you have it because it doesn't show itself after, except after a few days, and you basically cause this person and their family irreparable harm. So it's not just even about ourselves. So this is a matter of larger responsibility, and that is something our religion does in fact teach. Uh, so that's just one thing on the side that I wanted to mention. But you know, as this is a trial that affects virtually you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world, their livelihood is affected, their health, it's not just their health that may be affected, their sense of safety may be affected, the resources they have access to may get affected. You know, a lot of people depend for their livelihood or for family reasons they have to travel and their travel is affected. So life gets disrupted by these kinds of things. And it can be a very difficult trial. So I'm sure there are people that have had to make many serious changes in their life as a result of what's going on. You know, border closings and governmental shutdowns and all kinds of things that are happening. So as a result of that, I wanted to highlight something that, you know, I was thinking about what to give khutbah about today. And I don't want to give a khutbah about the coronavirus. But what I do want to give a khutbah about is what does Allah say about scenarios in which people feel like the world is closing in on them? Or they're, they don't know where to go. Or they feel like they're completely vulnerable and subject to attack, right? And one great parallel that I think is worthy of contemplation is what happens after, this is important now, after Musa salam crosses the water. So the Israelites have now escaped the Pharaoh. They are now in the desert. And I want you to understand what that scene looks like. These are... These are thousands and thousands of people, men, women, and children, that have left their homes behind, so they don't, probably don't even have another day's worth of clothes. They can't possibly have days and days and days worth of food, so they don't have a lot of food with them. And there are old among them, sick among them, children among them, babies among them, men among them, women among them, all kinds of people among them. And they are in the desert, so they actually don't even have shelter from the sun. So they're in the scorching sun, fine, they escape Fir'aun, which is immediate death, but the desert is a kind of death on its own, isn't it? And that's, that's where they find themselves, in the thousands. And so even if anybody, any one person is taking a sip of water, 20 people are looking at them desperately. This is the scenario in which we find ourselves, Allah describing this scene, and they're starting to get agitated because, you know, how are they going to survive? And they are going to turn to Musa alayhi salam, we're running out of water. That's obviously what's going to happen very quickly, we're running out of water, you know? It's very different from nowadays when you and I travel and we're like, man, we're out of snacks, we're out of chips. Okay, stop over at the next gas station. We, we, we take these, the access to food or access to drink as something for granted. They couldn't do that. They can't do that. They can't say, oh wait, I left my, I left my, my favorite juice back in Egypt. <laughs> they can't do that. They can't turn back because that's gone forever now. So in that scenario, Musa alayhi salam, had to speak to all of them. Now, they're at unrest, they're, nobody's sure what to do, and Musa salam basically has to give them a, a khutbah. He has to give them a talk in that emergency state. And that conversation is brief, it's in Surah Ibrahim, but it's really beautiful. Uh, because it's not just about what he said, but that Allah considered that conversation so timeless, and what they needed to hear. And these are the Muslims of that time. So when Allah says, or on the tongue of Musa, he says, 
اذ انجاكم من ال فرعون يسومونكم سوء العذاب ويذبحون ابناءكم ويستحيون نساءكم وفي ذلك بلاء من ربكم عظيم he says musa alayhi salam says to his people mention allah's favor on you when he just rescued you from the from the, the dynasty of the pharaohs they were humiliating you with the worst kinds of punishments they were slaughtering your sons they were letting your women live and in all of that in that rescue there was a great blessing of allah for you for you and in that trial there was a great trial for you so this bala means two things blessing and trial so in allah having you escape is an incredible blessing because nobody gets to escape the pharaoh not in the thousands anyway you can't just decide one day we're no longer slaves and we're going to walk out of here <laughs> nobody gets to do that Armies don't mess with the pharaoh's armies and you people walked out of slavery while they would they had the power to kill your children you know if nothing else a family would die to defend their own child a mom would run in front of a moving car as so as to not let the the, the car hit her child natural instinct you've seen videos of like animals when the lion comes after one of the small bulls or you know baby and the other animals that are no match for the lion herd together they'll defend their young it's nature that will defend our young you'll see a bird fighting against a snake that's trying to eat eggs right and the the pharaoh had so much power over the israelites that he was killing their children in front of them and they couldn't fight back like that's how suppressed they were that's how powerless they were so when musa alayhi salam saying Allah just helped you escape that. Would you forget escaping? You didn't even have the power to defend your own children. And everybody knows what it means to let the women live. You didn't even have the power to stop that from happening. And he allowed you to 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 get away from that. What a huge gift that is. Here they are thinking about the problem. What's at hand? The beaming sun, the lack of water, how are we going to the crying babies, the sick That's what they're thinking about. And Musa Ali Sam starts his conversation with actually you had a much bigger problem and an, and one that was impossible to escape. And it's not just saying look at the bright side and be grateful. Uh, there's obviously gratitude is immediately intended here, but the other intent is if Allah can bring you out of one impossible situation, why all of a sudden should we even entertain the thought that Allah would abandon us now? Well, how can you even think that? Look at what Allah just did for you. he did this for you and then he forgot about you in the desert is that is that what you're thinking you know he brought you through all of this only to leave you at this stage so have good opinion of allah and the way to have good opinion of allah is to think back in all the impossible situations that allah pulled you and me out of how impossible they seemed at the time how they seemed like the worst disaster and catastrophe at the time and allah pulled us out of it and he brought us out over and over again and he's reminding all of them of it Then he says to them, and this is this is one of my favorite ayat about gratitude and how how the Quran looks at gratitude. Wa id ta'adhan rabbukum la in shakartum la azidannakum. When your master had made a decree, when he made a pronouncement, ta'adhan. Now the word ta'adhan is, is interesting here because you didn't, you know, khairul kalami ma qalla wa dalla. You could say very little and get a point across. So you could say wa la in shakartum la azidannakum. Or Allah has said, if you're grateful, I will give you more and more. Easy. But the word ta'adhana is placed by the perfect wisdom of Allah. Ta'adhana comes from, you know, from, you know, adhan. Adhan is also the call to prayer. It's an announcement. Adhan is called an announcement because it goes in the udhun. It goes in the ear. Ta'adhana means when somebody opens up their ears and all else becomes muted and the thing that's being announced overtakes. So you know if you're having multiple conversations and one voice overpowers all others and kind of drowns out all the other voices that's an adhan that's why it's supposed to be louder than any other conversation that's that's what an announcement is right so ta'adhana actually suggests there are lots of thoughts in my head there are lots of thoughts i'm hearing or lots of words that i'm hearing even having conversations with myself but this decree of allah this pronouncement of allah needs to the ears need to tune everything else out and hear this as if until you get rid of all other thoughts and just hear this on its own you will not appreciate what's being said this is one of those things that requires a singular mind where everything else has to be erased so is what if the azdana rabbukum 
when your master made a pronouncement. You know, and of course when Musa alayhi salam is speaking, they know that he's speaking on behalf of Allah. He doesn't have to mention that Allah is telling me, Allah is telling me, Allah is telling me to tell you. But he mentions Rabbukum anyway. As if to suggest, you know, when, when somebody's speaking up, you know, because you know, I, 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 I'm working with the kids all the time, and if one of them is speaking louder than the others, nobody's paying attention. But if I try to chime in and say, hey, everybody listen up. And hopefully, most of them hear my voice and say, okay, 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 I gotta stop, I gotta listen. Because there's an, there's an authority when somebody else, a teacher in the classroom, when they raise their voice, then everybody else's voice goes down a little bit, you know? When, when you hear that your, your master made a pronouncement, then everything else gets put on hold. And the word Rabb is important here too, because Allah being a Rabb means that He's our provider, He's our caretaker, He's our protector, He's our nourisher. My preferred translation of the, Rabb, of the word Rabb in English is nurturing master. It's not just someone who owns you, someone who feeds you and takes care of you and protects you. All of that stuff is in included inside the word Rabb. So here you are feeling like, where's our nurturing going to come from? Where's our protection going to come from? And Allah says, well, listen to the one that gives you protection and nurturing and has authority over you. The kind of authority He has over you and me, we don't even have over our own bodies. He says, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Even if you were to be the, I, it's hard to translate this, but I'll try to add more English words to get the point across. Even if you were to be the least bit grateful, if you were at all grateful, like Allah is not in this ayah talking about us being grateful continuously and throughout our lives. Actually, that would have been in tashkuru, the mudari'ah form, the present tense form. Here it is, la'in shakartum, it's huduth. It's even if at one instant, you have shown me gratitude, real gratitude. You're truly grateful for whatever Allah has given you. You're truly grateful for it. And you don't turn to Allah and think, where are you? Why, why aren't you helping me? Why, you know, you could be doing better for me. If you can develop the sense of finding something to be grateful for. Now the question arises, these people are in the desert. They're still hot, they're still sweating as Musa is talking to them. So when he says, if you were even the least bit grateful, they could look around and say, grateful for what? What, what, do, you, what do you want me to be grateful for? You know? And the idea, because when you look around, the only things you can see are things to complain about. Things to not be grateful for. So what are you being grateful for? The previous ayah that I referred you to has the key to that question, has the answer to that question. If you and I can think about the times that Allah has come through for us in impossible situations, then first of all, you're grateful for what happened in the past. But more than anything else, you're grateful for the fact that you have someone on your side, someone watching over you, that does that for you time and again. His presence, His existence in your life is what you're grateful for. Even if you can't see anything positive around you, zero positives around you, the fact that Allah in the unseen is your Rabb, and he, He's been your Rabb and He's been taking care of you, that Iman is actually the number one thing to be grateful for. He's there. I'm not alone in this. I'm not insecure in this. I will take whatever precautions I can, but Allah will take care. And so, if ta'adhana rabbukum la in shakartum, even if you could show me the least bit of gratitude, think back and have remain positive about the presence of Allah in your life. What does Allah say? La azidannakum. This is one of the most comprehensive brief words in the Quran. He says, I will absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. There's three absolutes here. The lam is lam at-tawqid. The noon is noon thaqila, that means it's twice the emphasis. So the way I translate that is going to be clunky English. It's going to be, I will absolutely, for sure, definitely increase you. So he, he says that three times over. And the present tense form is used suggesting it's going to go on forever. So notice the contrast. You were grateful for a little bit, for like a moment. You showed one instance of gratitude. Allah responded with continuously giving you more and more and more and more and more. And what's even more incredible is Allah didn't say increase you in what? He didn't qualify. He didn't say I'll increase you in guidance or I'll increase you in patience or I'll increase you in tolerance or I'll increase you in endurance 
I'll increase you in strength. He didn't qualify it. Why? Because he is telling us the way in which he will give us more cannot be quantified. You cannot limit it to one thing or the other. He may increase you in money or in health or in safety or in, in protection or in guidance or in wisdom or in understanding or in forgiveness. Or There are so many things you need increase and I need increase in. And he didn't want to limit that to any one thing. So he says, لا أزيد I'll keep on giving you more and more and more and more and more. The, the last point here is in Arabic, when you have the if and then, you know, if you do this, then I'll do this. Right? There's a little bit of a language lesson, but I'll, I'll make it simple to understand. It's really beautiful. If you're grateful, then I'll give you more and more. S simplified. So there's an if and there's a then. But if you come to the next part of the ayah, وَلَا إِن كَفَرْتُمْ And even if you are ungrateful, if you're in denial of Allah's fear, kufr doesn't just mean to disbelieve in Allah. Kufr here is the, the antonym. The, you know, it's, uh, you know, khilaf al shukr It's the opposite of shukr here. Lid the shukr And so you can do, be grateful for something Allah does, that's called shukran al nirma You could be ungrateful for something Allah has done, that's called kufran al nirma So kufr doesn't just mean denial, it also means to be ungrateful. Now, he says, if you're grateful, I'll give you more and more and more. And if you are ungrateful, even if you're ungrateful, now, you would expect, but he says, if you are ungrateful, then, there should be a then, right? But the then is missing. The then would have been, وَلَا إِن كَفَرْتُمْ فَإِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيد But actually, the ayah says, وَلَا إِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيد My punishment for sure is intense. But he didn't make it connected to ingratitude directly. As if to give us relief. And say, no, you should just know that my punishment is intense. But I'm not tying it to your any act of ingratitude. Just because you forgot to be grateful or you were ungrateful, I won't necessarily immediately punish you with an intense punishment. But because you've become grateful, next time you're thinking about becoming ungrateful, know that I can be punishing too. But just like there was a there was a knot tied, لا إن شكرتم لا أزيد لكم. Both of them have lam. Those two lambs, what they do, they, they make it an if and a then. They're, they're locked in with each other. You want Allah to give you more and more and more? Be grateful. That's the rule. But what about if you're ungrateful? Then you're going to get punished. No, no. Allah says, and even if you are ungrateful, just know that I can, I can punish. My punishment is pretty intense. But I'm not telling you that if you are ungrateful, then absolutely I will punish you. If, I, if you're ungrateful, then just check yourself and come back to being grateful. He didn't make an if and then on the ingratitude. That's yet another thing to be grateful for. That Allah did not make that correlation because the fact of the matter is you and I are ungrateful most of our lives. There's no way we can actually truly be grateful to Allah for what He's done for us. We can have moments of gratitude. We can have moments where we, our heart actually recognizes what Allah has done. We can have moments where we fall in sajda out of sincere gratitude towards Him. You know, people ask me sometimes, um, why should I pray? I mean, cause just because Allah is going to throw me in hell if I don't pray, actually. Where does, what does prayer begin with? What, what, what you, once you say Allahu Akbar and you start the prayer, the first thing you're reciting is the Fatiha. And in the Fatiha, the first thing you're saying is Alhamdulillah, isn't it? Allah is telling you what the prayer is for. If you feel grateful, you'll pray. That pr prayer is actually a sign that you recognize Allah's favors on you. You're, you're acknowledging Allah's favors on you. You're acknowledging how grateful you are and I am. That's what prayer is. When prayer is getting weaker, actually, it's not necessarily all parts of your iman. You still believe in God. You still believe in the, the last day. You still believe in heaven and hell. What might be becoming weaker is your sense of gratitude. That might actually be becoming weaker. So this is a time for you and I to... We want more. We want more protection. We want more safety. We want our children to be okay. We want our parents to be okay. There are you know, warnings about people of older age that are at higher risk, for example. Right? Or children with certain diseases or people that have you know, um, you know, immune deficiencies and things like that. They're, they're at risk. And we have loved ones that are in that state. So we're scared about that. We're worried about that for ourselves and our families. This is the time where we want Allah to give us more and more and more. So this is the time where as a spiritual exercise for all the families that are listening to this, myself included, that we sit with our children, we sit with our families, and we kind of talk about what is it that we are to be grateful for. What, did, what has Allah done for us? 
and recount, not just the things you see, look back and recount. What are the times that Allah did this and this and this? And how Allah brought us out? You know, the, these ayat, I didn't even share with you, this, these were like ayahs number six onwards. And I'll, I'll wrap up with this. In ayah number five, Allah says about Musa alayhi salam, وَلَقَلْ أَسْرَنَا مُوسَى بِآيَاتِنَا أَنْ أَخْرِجْ قَوْمَكَ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ النور. We, we gave Musa our revelation, so telling them, telling him, get your people out of darknesses into light. Get your people out of darknesses into light. And if you continue that imagery, get your people out of being ungrateful to being grateful. It's one of its, one of its themes. How does someone come out, of, come out of darkness to light? They go from being ungrateful to grateful. And you and I think dark times in our life and how Allah kept pulling us back into light over and over again. This is actually something we must do if we want for Allah to open the doors of rizq and open the doors of protection and give us more and more and more. So may Allah Azza make all of us, every one of us in our lives, worthy of more and more and more by His, by his favor. And may Allah Azza accept our gratitude and our acknowledgement of His favor that is felt from our hearts and declared to Him. وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّهِ As for the favor your master has done for you, then talk about it. Allah says talk about it. So talk to family about it, discuss it, you know. Don't just, say, don't just sit with your family and say, well, if I die, then what are you going to do? Or if you die, then what? Okay, yeah, you can discuss the emergency state. Because as if our conversations are going to secure our future. We can talk about that in a, in, a, in a spiritual sense, carry on doing good deeds. But actually, just as important, looking back and thinking about what Allah has done for us. That's actually security. That's actually increase coming from Allah. May Allah give us all increase in our lives in a way that is most beneficial for us. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa'a wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lazhi mustafa'a khususan ala afdalihim wa khatam al-nabiyin Muhammad al-Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in qala Allahu azza wa jal fi kitabi al-kareem ba'da an aqula a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله هيا للصلاة هيا للفلاة قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بحسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى وَنُيَسِّرُكَ لِلْيُسْرَى فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى سَيَذَّكَّرُ مَنْ يَخْشَى وَيَتَجَنَّبُهَا الْأَشْقَى الَّذِي يَصْلَى النَّارَ الْكُبْرَى ثُمَّ لَا يَمُوتُ فِيهَا وَلَا يَحْيَى قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا 
والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا لفي الصحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين هل أتاك حديث الخاشية وجوه يومئذ خاشية عاملة ناصبة تصلى نارا حامية تسقى من عين آنية ليس لهم طعام إلا من ضنيع لا يسمن ولا يغني من جوع وجوه يومئذ ناعمة لسعيها راضية في جنة عالية لا تسمع فيها لاغية فيها عين جارية فيها سرر مرفوعة وأكواب موضوعة ونمارق مصفوفة وزرابي مبثوثة أفلا ينظرون إلى الإبل كيف خلقت وإلى السماء كيف رفعت وإلى الجبال كيف نصبت وإلى الأرض كيف سطحت فذكر إنما أنت مذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر إلا من تولى وكفر فيعذبه الله العذاب الأكبر إن إلينا إيابهم ثم إن علينا حسابهم الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله